Oh. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thank you for that very warm welcome. It's great to be here. It's not my first visit to, to New Orleans, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's lovely to have this, uh, this audience and this, uh, this chance for a chat. Now, as Dave mentioned, I've had this um, uh, background just, just by coincidence, uh, really geographically, uh, where I trained and worked for a number of years in uh, Manchester in England. And now, just in the last couple of years, I'm based in Auckland in New Zealand. And both of those places, again, so by coincidence, happen to be areas where there's been developing a body of uh, research, um, applied research, really, clinical research, in the area of evoked potentials for pediatric um, uh, populations. So it's, um, it's through these sorts of uh, chance you know, happenings that I've become involved in it. My own personal interest from the um, perspective of auditory late response corticals actually stems from, from adults, um, people with single-sided deafness. That's, that, those, are the, those are the key areas that I've personally been, been involved in, but, but just through uh, you know, the kind of collaborative stra uh, strands and research links, then I've also had a, a, a um, valuable opportunity to think about pedi pediatric applications. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, before we actually unpack the nitty-gritty of it, then I'll just draw your attention to, as Dave just, just hinted at there, the uh, Intracoustics Academy. And because I, I think this is relevant to one of the points earlier that, um, that John Ferraro made, which is that sometimes if, if we think about uh, clinical procedures, technologies, and applications that we didn't get the chance to learn about in, uh, in when we were at college, then it can be hard to access that information. So I'd, I'd draw your attention to the Intracoustics Academy. Now, we're a, a team of audiologists based in Denmark, but dotted around the world. I'm the one, I'm the South, Southern Hemisphere guy. Um, and we're, we're in, interested in unpacking the evidence base for the t different technologies and clinical applications. And you'll find a lot of information online, webinars, e-learning content. And if you want to refresh any information, particularly in this case related to corticals, but across the whole span of audiological and vestibular um, you know, tests and, and applications, then I'd, I'd recommend just come and have a look at our website because, you know, it's just intracoustics.com forward slash academy. It's all, it's all just there waiting for you. And in particular, when it comes to um, a kind of uh, a, a safe way to, to test the water, to dip your toes into the water when it comes to a new clinical procedure, then um, I draw your attention to our, we're very proud of it, our feature known as the virtual clinic. And uh, on here, you take on the role of an audiologist. Um, you go into a waiting room and pick a patient. Um, and through a series of multiple choice questions, you have to elicit a history. Work out what the symptoms are for that patient. Depending on which questions you ask, then you'll either get silly answers or maybe sensible answers. And then you have to think, OK, well, based on this group of symptoms, what might be the problem, so then you'll choose the test that you want to do. Now you can, there's no limit, you can choose throughout the whole range of uh, all of the different procedures that we might be called upon to do in real life. Um, believe it or not, there's something like 70 or 80 distinct different procedures that an audiologist has to know about. So we've got all of them on there. You can't carpet bomb it though, okay, because like just in real life there's big time, time constraints, so you have to choose the test in which order, and then you'll get some results. and um, and then you'll uh, be asked to interpret those results and work out what's wrong with the patient. And then you can do a quiz at the end to see if you got it right. So I just uh, um, mention that now because it's kind of a risk-free way to dip your toes in and hopefully that addresses some of the points, some of those valid points that were raised this morning. Anyway, on with the show. So here's what we're going to do. So um, I'm going to just talk you through the rationale. So. Uh, we need to think about this auditory late response. You can see that I've put in there in inverted commas corticals. And what does that mean? Because there are a lot of synonyms for this, uh, this technique. You might see the synonym LLR for long or late latency response. You might sometimes just see the phrase N1P2 complex or some other such uh, comment which often refers to the labeling of the actual waveform. In the um, interacoustics protocols, you'll see the phrase auditory late response. I'll try in a few slides time to define very specifically 
what I mean. But anyway, that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about that and why that might be relevant in some pediatric um, populations. Then we'll just consider what's good about it. Why is this relevant? What's, what are the limitations from a clinical point of view? And in a nod to the title of the whole uh, masterclass, Today and Tomorrow, then we can think about um, what you might see on the horizon in the coming uh, years. Okay, so here's what I mean at least at a first glance from an adult perspective. In the very top left of the slide, you can see a waveform there. It's a very commonly, this is just a kind of, you know, a, a grand average from a whole group of normally hearing people. This is what it might look like, a very audible response. This N1P2 complex. So that's what I'm talking about here. And like Dave said, it's quite commonly used in the UK, particularly for adults who might have a functional uh, hearing loss, uh, non-organic, and where there might be a medical legal component attached. In the US, I can think of many applications where that might be relevant, particularly from a veterans affairs point of view. Um, and the reason why this is used, as opposed to a lower uh, so, so a brainstem response, for example, is because it allows you objectively to assess the whole or a much greater proportion of the auditory pathway. And this is really relevant. Now, I just, on my way from New Zealand, stopped by uh, Rady Hospital in San Diego. So that's Ju Judy, Julian Kerry over there. And it just so happened that we had a patient. Now, this was a pediatric patient, um, but the same applies to adults. It just so happened that we had a patient there who had... Uh, um, cortical deafness. She'd had a stroke and um, no hearing loss initially was recognized because her OEs were normal and her brainstem responses were normal. But then mom later on uh, raised the flag to say, look, this child is behaving like a deaf child. So we did some corticals and sure enough, the corticals were absent. So that child was cortically deaf. That's, that's a good demonstration of where this type of response um, can, be, can be useful for testing the whole of the auditory pathway. And that's when you want to assess threshold. So uh, the same type of thing we were talking about this morning, estimating the audiogram, but with a different tool. But that's one application. What's going to be the focus of our attention today is in this middle part of the slide. And here, we're not interested in threshold estimation, but here we're interested in evaluating the success or otherwise, the audibility or otherwise, of sounds through a hearing aid. Okay, so we're talking about super threshold, conversational level signals um, that are heard in the sound field usually uh, via hearing aids. And um, you can see the morph this is an adult morphology, this is a child's morphology, and it looks somewhat different. And I'm going to unpack in a couple of slides time precisely why that is. And then towards the end of the session, we'll come and we'll think about, uh, this is the today and the tomorrow bit, uh, we'll think about some of the uh, objective measures of discrimination. So these tests tell us about whether a sound is audible, whether a sound has been heard or not. Um, we have some other options to tell us whether two sounds are heard as two distinct sounds. Um, so are they discriminated? All right. Um, this is what you might see if you were doing threshold estimation. So the clinical question actually is just the same each time as it is for the ABR. It's, is the response present or is it not? It's a yes-no response, or no, yes-no clinical question. And uh, you see a response present, and you turn the dial down, and you keep looking to see how low can you turn the dial until the response disappears, like here. And so here we can see a response at 10 dB HL, and this, this is a normal hearing person. And it's got a similar type of uh, accuracy as, as, the, uh, as the ABR when, when, when done you know, according to some predefined protocols, you're likely to be within about 10 dB of the behavioral threshold, so a similar degree of accuracy. Okay, why do we call it a cortical? Just to draw contrast to these, some of these other evoked potentials that you might be familiar, familiar with. Uh, tomorrow we're going to hear about the ECOG, which is a very low-level response. Of course, earlier on we were talking about brainstem activity, but this is the one I've highlighted in red. This is the adult morphology. And, uh, oops, we call it a cortical because at least the main, brains, uh, the main neural generators um, can be uh, localized to the temporal lobes where the auditory cortices lie. Let me just draw your attention to, uh, to this slide over here. And again, this is just to unpack that phrase corticals just a little bit because I'm using it somewhat loosely. Okay, so... 
if we were to zoom in on the temporal lobes, we'd see that it was all laminated. It's a sheet, sheets of uh, um, brain tissue, cortical tissue, and we have um, a, la a large population of those, cor those cortical cells, or these pyramidal cells. And, oops. Um, okay. And when the, uh, cortical, uh, when the cortical sheet is stimulated with afferent input from, from the periphery, from the ears, then um, that, that information arrives somewhere down here in, in layer four, and it causes a change in the ionic currents within the cell, a depolarization. So if we were to have a look at the electromagnetic field surrounding that cell, bioelectrical field, then we could see some pattern like this that changes when uh, afferent stimulation arri arrives, okay? And um, that's, the, uh, that's what we can call, we can use loosely the phrase dipole. And that changes, but the electrodes that are on the scalp remain in, spatially in the same position. So we can see a change in the electromagnetic field, which ultimately induces a change in the current in our instruments, and that's specifically what we're measuring. Okay. And if we were to try and triangulate where that, uh, where, where that altered dipole is coming from, then at least for, to a first approximation, when we have a look at that, N, that N1 component of the response I was just talking about, then it, then it localizes to the temporal lobes. But it's 100 milliseconds in latency, so there's a lot of activity going on in other different parts of the auditory system, including uh, subcortical regions and other places in the cortex. So I don't want to, when I use that phrase corticals, I am just using it a little bit loosely, and that's why we use perhaps a more catch-all phrase, uh, the auditory late response. Okay. So now um, I mentioned there's some uh, differences in uh, the adult morphology as compared with the pediatric morphology. And this is the one that we're particularly interested in for this application, the pediatric morphology. The key differences are as follows. It's generally quite a lot later. So if we have a look at this P1 component somewhere, uh, this is a grand average uh, response, somewhere around 200 milliseconds. But that becomes a lot earlier in an adult, somewhere between maybe 30, 50, 60 milliseconds, depending on the stimulus parameters. That's attracted a lot of interest when it comes to developing the evidence base for early intervention. Um, so you might, uh, you might know of um, people's work like Anu Sharma, for instance, have talked about that. Um, the other big difference between the adult and infant morphology, as well as latency, is that the amplitude is a lot higher. So for a super threshold stimulus, it can be a much bigger response as compared with, with um, an adult. And we can talk a, few, a, a bit just briefly about some of the reasons for that. In particular, um, this has been a well-researched topic from uh, the house, uh, from Curtis Ponton and others, and I think this is perhaps the, the clearest demonstration of those changes. Now, if we um, think about the OAEs and the ABR in terms of their maturation, so what we're seeing here is different age groups across childhood. Uh, the OAEs are very much um, in their mature state in the neonatal period. The ABR, well, from a clinical point of view, we don't worry about it too much, but there are maturational changes for a couple of years, perhaps. But for these cortical responses, then we see maturational changes that progress throughout childhood into adolescence to the extent that we don't really see the, the, the full adult morphology until early adulthood. It's quite interesting, the reasons for this. This is some histological data from uh, both uh, young, uh, two, two years old and 12 year old um, cortical sheet. And these columns, these show uh, staining of the cell bodies of those pyramidal cells that I was talking about earlier. And they're similar between the two age groups, okay? But these other columns right here, okay, so the second and the fourth column, they show the uh, histological staining of the neural connections, the, uh, the dendrites and the axons. And in this upper sheet, that's where the difference lies, in particular for the, uh, for the N1 response there. So in the early uh, years of life, this, the fine synaptic connections um, haven't formed yet, and so we see um, an immature response. And then as the, uh, as, the, as the person learns to hear and as their cortex develops, then the, the latencies become progressively earlier. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. I just thought I'd provide that 
just because of essentially what Dave said, is that I think in, in historically these cortical responses haven't, been, um, haven't captured the, the interest in all different parts of the world to the same extent. And so I thought you might benefit or appreciate that, that background. And if you want to learn more, and if you want also for the, for the threshold estimation application, then come and have a look at the webinar that we've got on that. But now we're just going to really um, unpack one key point, which stems from a lot of the discussion that we had this morning when it comes to the rationale for uh, objectively evaluating um, a hearing aid fitting in the sound field. OK, so um, I want to draw your attention to this slide, which I've taken from um, a paper from Dave, Dave Stapel some years ago. And it's reasonably representative of what, you know, of, of various other sort of similar plots like this that you see, and we saw some this morning. I'm just going to pick out one. Uh, so what we see on the, on the uh, y-axis is um, the threshold as defined by an ABR. Now, being in this era, it's a tone ABR. Um, and what we see on the x-axis is the pure tone, the behavioral pure tone threshold. Okay. We might expect some small differences if we were to repeat such a test these days, such an assessment like this, but use the chirp stimulus. But I would um, suggest that we'll probably see a similar pattern, which is this. If we were to take, say, our threshold at 60 at this two kilohertz place, this is after we've applied the NHL to EHL correction. So we might um, estimate for a 60 dB ABR threshold that that's the behavioral threshold. That's what we're trying to do. We haven't got the behavioral threshold, but we want it. So this is the information that we have, and we can use this relationship to work out what the behavioral threshold would have been, okay? But if you look, if we say, okay, physiological threshold is 60, so we predict the behavioral threshold would have been 60 or, or thereabouts. But if you look, that's just applying for the average. So the emphasis here is on estimation. There is a spread, which I'm showing with these yellow uh, lines here. That's the spread there. So in other words, some people, we estimate their threshold as 60, but maybe their real threshold is a bit higher than 60, and we've underestimated their true threshold. On the other hand, other people at the other end of, the, of this distribution, we will have overestimated their threshold. Okay? And that's not um, something that's specific to one type of stimulus or one type of hearing instrument. It's just an inherent, um, an inherent property of our estimation of a behavioral threshold. Okay? Now, this um, range here is usually expressed in terms of standard deviations. And one standard deviation is about 10 dB. So what that means is, what that means is that around about two-thirds of the population, our accuracy at estimating someone's behavioral threshold is going to be within 10 dB. And that's what we often, you know, that's the rule of thumb that we say, that we go by. But there is another one-third of the population, outliers on either side of that distribution, where our estimation accuracy will be more than 10 dB. More, and some people will have underestimated, and other people will have overestimated their hearing loss by that amount. A minority will be extreme outliers, okay, more than two standard deviations away from the mean, that will be about 1 in 20 patients that we see, where the error will therefore be more than two standard deviations, more than 20 dB out. Sometimes this might happen systematically you know, across a number of frequencies. More likely, it would just happen you know, at one or two frequencies. Okay? Now, there's almost nothing that we can do about this. This is what we accept as, um, an, accurate, uh, as an acceptable level of error in our measures. But what it does mean is that we do need to then go back at least and have a look to make sure how successful was our hearing aid fitting. Now, when you fit a hearing aid in an adult, what do you do in terms of your evaluation, in terms of assessing how accurate or how successful it might be? Okay, so switch the hearing aid on for the first time after having used their threshold to plot a gain curve. And then you'll say, well, how does that sound? That's your first throw at the dice, right? And maybe they'll say, okay, sounds good. Or maybe they'll say, mm, uh, sounds a bit too tinny or bassy. Maybe they'll say that it's too loud or too soft. And then you might even go right back immediately and start making adjustments based on that verbal evaluation. Okay? But it is just kind of informal at that point. You will also, no, no doubt, do a more of a structured approach. Perhaps you'll use questionnaires such as the COSI, the client-orientated scale of improvement. 
Um, you might do speech assessment. Okay? But all these rely upon, um, upon some, uh, uh, of course, some complex behavioral interaction with your, with your patient. Okay, now, if we bring that, um, that, that scenario down in age to these pediatrics that we're interested in, then what do you do? Well, you can ask the parents of this deaf child, how do you think your child's getting on now that you're, you know, you, you've been fitted with hearing aids? And they might give you some, they might give you some verbal you know, some feedback. It's indirect, of course. They'll be just basing whatever they say on what they've seen happening. Maybe the child wakes up when they hear a loud sound. Maybe their eyes widen, or maybe they see that the child is searching for the source of a sound, but it will be somewhat hit and miss. Okay, we can also do sa the same sort of thing in the clinic, behavioral observational audiometry. We can watch for reactions to sound, but it, ca it can be inconclusive. If you didn't see a reaction to a sound, what does that mean? Does that mean that the sound wasn't heard? Or did it just mean that the child was doing their own thing, sleeping, or whatever? Okay, so it drives a need, both the potential for this error that I've tried to describe and, um, uh, and our limitation in what we can gauge from just behavioral assessment, this drives a need for objective assessment, okay? Now, the other um, component to that is that as we have um, progressed in terms of uh, history over, over time with, uh, with the newborn hearing screening program, then we know that the age at fitting becomes earlier and earlier and earlier, which is a good thing. And that comes back to the Yoshinago, Yoshinago Atano um, kind of uh, message and others very well researched. The earlier the intervention, uh, the happier that we are as audiologists. So that's kind of conveyed by this slide. So this comes from the UK. This is uh, the cohorts uh, the performance of the screen, this is an audit of the um, screen since the time when the, um, the UK newborn hearing screening program went universal, covering those with risk factors and those without risk factors. Okay, and then this is time in days. So you can see, uh, if we go the, the dotted line, which is this one, you can see that screening was always happening at a very early stage. That's good, obviously, in the neonatal period. First assessment, ABR, and these days, to some extent, ASSR, also happening relatively quickly and um, within the first couple of weeks of, of, of life, so that's great. But initially, when it came to um, actually intervention, and that's the bit that really matters, it's, not, it's, what, it's only halfway there to identify the problem. We actually have to do something about it. And initially, when the screen went universal, audiology departments in general weren't well set up. To, to do that at an early stage. It took some time, but as you can see, there's been a gradual um, decrease in the age at which children have been fitted with um, hearing aids. So we've got this dual effect going on. We've got patients that are younger and younger and younger. We've got a need to evaluate their fitting um, objectively. And it, as it happens, the median age of fitting, at least in this cohort from a few years ago, maybe it's even younger, I, I don't know, um, these days is uh, around 80 days. And that reflects uh, also some reports earlier from, from Yvonne and others uh, for here in the US. All right, so um, that's the rationale. That's what we need to do and why. Here's um, the patient journey from left to right. So we've talked this morning about assessment, ABRs and so on and so on. My second talk afterwards is uh, going to think about evoke potentials that can be used in this stage here, evaluating or verifi sorry, evaluating, verifying um, an instrument. So that will be for implants. You, you don't need evoke potentials to do this for an acoustical hearing aid. You'll be used to verifying your instruments using um, the real ear to couple of difference. Um, and if it's, a, uh, if it's a bone anchored hearing aid, then maybe a, a skull simulator too. Um, but what we're talking about now is this, this stage, later on in the pathway. So here's where we are in terms of an individual. And another question that might be on your minds at this stage is, why did I mention the sound field earlier? Why did I mention a loudspeaker? When everything else up to this point in our patient journey will have been with more likely inserts or sometimes the supraoral style headphones. But the reason why we uh, revert to the sound field for this application is because we want the child to be wearing the hearing aid, okay? So we have the hearing aid in the sound path. A, a sound is presented by a loudspeaker, and that's what allows that to happen. 
There is an alternative um, approach, which is direct audio input, and we can, talk, we can touch on that just briefly later on. But those are the two reasons why we deviate from using inserts or headphones. It's because we want the hearing aid to be in the sound pathway. And in terms of um, other things on our wish list, well, we'd like to be able to use speech stimuli. We think that this has greater face validity, in particular, um, that the hearing aid will react to a signal, a speech token, as it would any other speech-like sound, and that's what we're interested in amplifying primarily. So, and the hearing aid may not recognize a very short duration stimulus such as a tone burst or a chirp or a click in that way. So we want to have a signal and evoke potential that can be triggered by a speech signal and also that the hearing aid will be um, listening to that as a speech signal too. And the corticals fill, fulfill that um, criteria. And then ideally, in an ideal world, we'd also like to be able to test discrimination, but we'll see about that when we come to the MMN. All right. So this is a timeline now of a, pa of a patient, and we're just going to go through all the uh, things that happened to that patient according to that patient journey I showed you. So in the neonatal period now, we've got the, uh, the diagnosis, the, the assessment. Um, of course, there's the audiological side, but there's also the medical side as well. So it might involve scanning and blood tests and so on. And then eventually we'll fit the hearing aids using our estimated hearing level, and then we'll verify them using the coupler, and that's fine. But then please note, what happens then? Well, in a typical patient, from a, an assessment point of view, without these corticals, you're really quite limited, right? I mean, what do you do? You, you probably speak to the parents and see them again for, you know, counseling sessions and reassurance. You might do... Um, uh, re replacement of the ear molds because of the growth of the ear canal and then if you don't then they won't fit and there's a rapid sort of growth period in those first few months of life. Um, so re-verification and, and evaluation. Okay. And that re-verification as I say is related to the, uh, the change in the ear canals. It happens very, very rapidly. And it's in this period, it's in this period where the child is perhaps too young to reliably do behavioral assessments but um, we still have this need to evaluate the hearing aid. This is where the corticals can come in. And another feature of them is that they're relatively large in amplitude. We touched on that earlier. And so it's possible to feasibly do this uh, test routinely while the child is awake. The child's going to be sleeping something like uh, 18 to 20 hours a day in the first few months of life. But as they get to six months and eight and nine months, then they're going to be much more alert, and uh, it's going to be harder to do ABRs and ASSRs under natural sleep, at least. So that's another reason. Of course, eventually, when the child becomes old enough, we can transition to behavioral assessments, and then we can leave our objective assessments down, we can down-prioritize down them. So it's in, this, it's in this period of life where, where we're interested. But I will just say, I will just make one side point here, which is that in addition to transitioning to behavioral assessments of hearing, either speech tests or perhaps VRA and so on. I'd also encourage you, if you're not already doing so, to consider balance because something like two-thirds of children who are born with permanent childhood hearing impairment, sorry, who are diagnosed with permanent childhood hearing impairment, about two-thirds of them have a vestibulopathy as well. And about half of that was, uh, is bilateral severe vestibulopathy. And the reasons aren't that hard to imagine. If you can think about a cause of Permanent childhood hearing impairment could be hypoxia, it could be um, jaundice, it could be um, to ototox the medication that was provided for some reason that reached an ototoxic level. Now, quite often those, those issues aren't selective just for the um, structures in the, in the uh, cochlear part of the inner ear, but also the vestibular part. So I'd also um, think about the uh, potential for, um, for, for, for vestibular assessment too. Um, there was a, a recent uh, dedicated article on this um, in uh, Seminars in Hearing, this, the third issue this year. So you can check that out if you're interested. But in terms of vestibular assessment, then this is actually not as um, daunting as it might sound. Um, some V-hit or something like that would be very feasible and very useful in that child's life. If you didn't, and there was a vestibulopathy, then um, what, what's likely to happen is that the, the child won't have the vertigo that we often associate with an adult with uh, vestibulopathy. 
because they've had it for a long time and it's, it's, it becomes normal for them. So you don't often get the concrete symptoms, but what you'll see is problems manifesting themselves later on. So maybe that child's motor milestones are delayed. Okay? Um, may, maybe uh, they don't ride a bike or participate in sports in the same way as um, the other children, but that isn't necessarily recognized as uh, a vestibulopathy because it is, is separated in time. The, the, the issues manifest themselves much later when it's kind of out in the haze. So if you can raise a flag um, and do something about that from an early stage, that might be really useful in that child's life. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. This is the basic setup for um, evaluating a child in the sound field. So it's just like, really, it's just like doing VRA. So your child's old enough to sit on mum's lap, and they've got the hearing aid on. This is from the UK, and this is from Rady in San Diego just a few days ago. Um, in this case, the, the loudspeaker's just off to the child's side, and you can see the child's wearing the hearing aids, and uh, it's got the electrodes on. I'll talk about the montage in a few. And the, and the audiologist said, it's like a, a tag team, you know, so you've got someone just um, maintaining low-level attention, not too exciting, just, just occupy the child's attention. Sometimes the child might not need that audiologist. Maybe they just occupy themselves for a while with a little toy, or, or we were doing this also with um, older children just with an iPad, uh, you know, in the lap, so that's fine. And it's battery, so you shouldn't need to worry about, uh, you know, um, electrical interference too much either. Okay, so that's the basic setup. And this is what you might end up with. Now, this is grand average data. I'll show you um, some individual data shortly. This comes from um, Manchester. And uh, it's currently unpublished, but it's, I, I gather it's in prep. And what they did was they just took a, a cohort of normally hearing children that had passed their newborn hearing screen and there was no um, parental concern for hearing or, or family history or anything like that. And they sat them in front of a loudspeaker and they just played some speech tokens at conversational volumes. Okay? And so these are normal hearing, so there's no hearing aids at this point. I'll show you some um, later, uh, some traces with a child with hearing loss. But what the, the, the point of this slide is just to convey broadly what we're looking at um, and feasibility. So uh, there was around about nine times out of 10, if you statistically assess the presence or absence of such a waveform like this, um, then it was present. And then the residual noises after 150 sweeps, which was taken for all, th so 150 times three, it's taken them around about half an hour. Although you can see there's some range here, so maybe pragmatically this full appointment might be like an hour's kind of an appointment. Okay? And um, so that's what you're looking for. Now, that's grand average data. Let me just tell you a bit about the stimuli, and then we'll have a look at some individual data. So these are the stimuli. So um, these come from now. We also have, um, so now in Australia, we also have on your Eclipse, if you're an Eclipse user, um, some broadly equivalent speech tokens that come from Nina Krause's lab okay, in Chicago. Oh, sorry, in Northwestern, anyway. Um, but these three tokens, just that we're interested in for those grand average data, so it's a, a, a ma, and that has rather a low frequency emphasis with the peak here. Uh, there's a ta there, and you can see that's got a, a high frequency emphasis. This is one of those stimuli, the ga, just in the sound field. So the 30 to 40 milliseconds in duration. So considerably longer than, um, uh, than the chirps and the tone, tone bursts and so on that we might be used to for, for ABR. Okay, so these, that's the spectral content of the stimuli, but um, now you can, in theory, you could uh, pick up or present these sounds using any type of loudspeaker. But an important point came up earlier this morning when we were thinking about uh, the chirps, which is the filtering effect of the frequency response of the loudspeaker. So um, I'd really recommend an audiological loudspeaker, which generally they have a very flat frequency response across the audiometric range, so that we're not inadvertently um, attenuating the very high or the very low frequencies. Um, and the, the, the speaker that we're going to do a demonstration on later is the radio ear, uh, radio ear speaker. And the other small point to make is that it needs to be um, an active loudspeaker. So when these eclipses were um, first introduced, then they were designed in order to drive a, um, a headphone, a bone conductor, or an insert phone. Now if you take a loudspeaker that needs more power, 
and you want to make it go at a high level, sort of 65 or even 75 dB SPL, a raised voice level, then you're not going to have enough power from the Eclipse on its own. So it needs to be an active loudspeaker where it's got its own amplifier built in. And as I say, we can, uh, the recommendation at this point would be a, an audiometric one, such as the Radio Ear SP90. All right. Now, this is the small um, contribution that I've uh, made to that uh, grand average data in terms of helping to analyze these results for, and comparing for uh, different electrode montages. Okay, so what we did was we took, um, we took the, those, uh, those children, those normally hearing, this is just a smaller subset, and we looked at the size of the response for the ma, the ga, and the ta when we had an electrode on the, on the vertex position, CZ, and then on the high forehead position. And, that, and that's relevant because normally when we think about the ALR, we'd like to, for the biggest amplitude, we'd like to put the, the electrode on the vertex. And then the other one might be on the mastoid or sometimes on the nape of the neck. Okay? So we're recording from these two positions, and normally that would give us the biggest amplitude. But the problem is that the, the hair um, can just lift the electrode off, those types of electrode that Dave was showing us this morning, and it can, can lead to problems. So it would be really nice if we could just use a skin patch, like the high forehead. So what did we find in this study? Well, um, so the blue lines represent the, the vertex, and then the red lines the high forehead. And then the amplitude of the responses, so the blue lines are consistently bigger than the red lines. So the amplitudes were indeed bigger at the vertex. So signal is bigger. But this shows you the residual noise on the y-axis for those three different stimuli. And the residual noises were also consistently bigger for the vertex. So by the time you look at signal-to-noise ratio, there's not a great deal of difference between uh, the vertex and the... So you've got nothing to lose, and from a convenience point of view, everything to gain. So that would be the, at least my recommendation for, for the montage. Now, th these are the grand average data. Let me just show you some individuals, just so you can get a feel for how it can vary from one person to another. This is one, this is one, uh, one individual for the two different electrode positions, the vertex and the CZ, and that's a ta stimulus. Okay, um, doesn't look too different to the grand average. Here's another one where morphology is a little bit different again, but you can see clear repeatability. Here's another one, again, not so different to the grand average. This is a ma stimulus, uh, patient number 19 out of the 87. And this one looks like it's, uh, it's clearly there, it's clearly repeatable, but it's somewhat different to the grand average. Here's another one again, but this one looks not so dissimilar to the adult morphology, and that can happen from time to time, as we'll see later on as well. So um, when we talk about the waveform or the, the, uh, the pediatric ALR, there's no one template that it looks like all the time. You have to maybe roll with the punches a little bit. And to a large extent, the gold standard for uh, viewing whether there's a response present or not is a visual assessment. Okay. Oh, I got one more in there too, so there's another one. And indeed, here are some from, uh, I keep mentioning Rady, so San Diego, these were just measured just the other day. And uh, this was a, an eight-year-old girl who was uh, normally hearing. She was just sitting in front of the loudspeaker um, on her iPad while we measured. So she's kind of, her, her morphology is in that sort of transitional stage. It doesn't look so different to, to the adult morphology to me. All right. So where are we up to? Let's think. So we've got a response that um, demonstrates audibility at the cortex, and it reliably does it, as I hope that those last few slides showed. I didn't talk about this too much, but I'll just briefly mention it now. Another rationale for using the corticals is it, it nicely correlates with speech perception. And this study, it, it involves auditory neuropathy children. We're not interested in auditory neuropathy per se in this uh, comment. But what they did was they just took a cohort and half of those children with auditory neuropathy had good speech perception and half had poor speech perception. And when they measured the corticals, there was a very clear dichotomy. The half that had good speech perception also showed cortical evoked responses. And the other half with poor speech perception didn't. I'm just using that as that one, as a useful, one, one example to show that relationship. Some other rationale would be that as the patient uh, gets older and more alert and less likely to sleep naturally, then they're going to be moving around. And this larger cortical response is much more robust against myogenic activity. 
Um, I talked about the, the hearing aid effect. So we want the hearing aid to recognize the signal as speech, um, uh, apply the correct amount of gain as you've prescribed for speech, and, um, and of course, uh, any other uh, features such as noise reduction algorithms and feedback management. We don't want that to cut out the signal, um, compression circuitry and so on. And then any artifacts, so post-auricular muscle if the child's moving around and any hearing aid artifacts, they will occur very early in latency and our response is happening downstream, so they're temporarily separated. All right, so that brings me to the first kind of staging point in my talk. Better check the time, I need to motor. Um, there's a couple of questions for you, so please feel free to respond. All right. Now, Dave, you might, where are you? You might need to guide me what I'm supposed to do again. I, I click on here. I, don't, I press activate, is that right? No, the one below. The one below, okay. Okay. Okay, so some variation. Now, um, there's no right, right or wrong answer, but the result that, we were, uh, that I was showing you suggested that the, the high forehead to the vertex might be, um, might be a useful, uh, uh, a, a, good, a, a good one to, to go for. Okay, let's move on. What's the typical age range? All right. So hopefully that's enough time. Let's see what we got. So show responses. Yeah, absolutely. I'd go with that. Well, either of those two, C and A. Um, of course, there's no reason why, the, why this application couldn't be applied to adolescents or adults. You might have an adult with you know, um, learning difficulties, uh, perhaps they've had a stroke, some other reason for why you couldn't do the normal behavioral type of interactions, and this could be used with them too. But the um, intended, at least for the purposes of our discussion, would be those, uh, those age groups. So that's cool. Let's move on. Sound stimuli are most used in pediatric applications. Absolutely, good. Perfect. And I think this is, uh, that's the last question for now, so uh, hold your horses. All right, so this is something along the lines of what we might actually see on the screen. So you've got your child on the parent's lap, okay? And let's just imagine for a moment uh, you, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about protocol um, later. Normally you would start with in the aided condition. That's your priority. So you might start at a moderate conversational level, 65 dB SPL, with the hearing aids in and switched on and ready to go. And if the child is hearing the speech token, then after those 150 or so sweeps, um, then you might expect to see a large response like that giving you an objective indication that the speech token was heard, okay? Now, if the child remains cooperative, then you might need to run through several different speech tokens, and that's great. And if the child still remains cooperative, then what would be really good, the next step would be then to take the hearing aids out and then do an unaided condition. And of course, the child now has a hearing loss. You don't change the dial setting on the, uh, on the system, so the signal is still presented at the same level, but without the hearing aids, that signal should be much less audible. And so the response should go flat, or in some cases with perhaps a mild loss, maybe the, the level of the response, the amplitude just drops markedly. So there you can see a very clear demonstration that the hearing aid is having the intended effect. Of course, on the other hand, if you saw a flat line, or very little difference between the aided and the unaided condition, then that might be giving you an indication that the, if, the if amplification isn't effective as we'd like. So that's the, that's the point, that's the, the question that we're trying to ask. Okay, now these are just cartoons that I've drawn. Let me show you some other data. This isn't a new, uh, a new issue, by the way. This has been you know, thought about for a long time in the literature. This is corticals to tones. But with, I say, with the sort of d development of universal screening, there's been renewed interest in this for perhaps the last 10 to 15 years. And here's um, a case from uh, Auckland. This is Professor Suzanne Purdy, 
based in the um, University of Auckland there, who's been um, a, 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 a kind of prominent figure driving this uh, literature. And this is a case from her. And here you can see a child with the hearing aids in, and clearly from the, the way in which the lines are flat there, not receiving effective amplification. In this case, the audiologist was prompted with this information, as well as other stuff, you know, other uh, history and other, other uh, observations and so on, to then progress more urgently to cochlear implant. And then with an implant in, now we can see um, that the sound, the same sounds were being heard more clearly. So that's, that's the point. Now, there's widespread work going on to sort of validate this, and uh, there's some... Uh, um, there's a study, ongoing study in the UK, which is uh, using an interacoustics eclipse mounted in the back of this truck. And this truck has a sound booth in it, and they drive around, and they, um, they do these hearing aid evaluations, uh, kind of um, an outreach type of, uh, you know, uh, type of a, an arrangement. Um, and, and there's others too. But let me just tell you about one particular study, which is a nice, a, a really nice demonstration of, of this on a, on a group level. So this comes from the... Uh, uh, comes from the, the, the research group based in Australia, the NAL group. Um, it's a few years old, relatively, uh, not, not too old, relatively recent. What they did was they just took a, relative, a small cohort of children who had bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Now, people with a unilateral loss, they're not targets for this type of assessment because whether you do aided or unaided, of course, they'll be able to hear the speech token in the sound field by their good ear. So they're not, so what we're, what we're interested in here is people with a bilateral sensory neural hearing loss of mild or worse. In this case, they had the fitting at the age that we're talking about, so relatively young. And, and what they did was they did their corticals. They started at 65. And then if they saw a cortical there, they went down to 55, a low, a sort of a, a low voicing level. And if they didn't see a cortical there, they, they went up, up to 75. So that's a simple uh, step procedure. But of course, then what they did was they waited until the child was old enough to then give them behavioral audiograms so they could look back and see, well, those corticals that they did or didn't measure, how did that relate to the audibility of the signal? So let's have a look at what they found. And again, this is just grand average for now on, on, the, on, those, on that cohort. And so they used the, uh, the ma and the ga and the ta. And the dotted line here, that shows you with the unaided, and that would have been done second, okay? But the solid line, um, that shows you the aided. So that, that's a clear increase in amplitude showing that the, the, the sound was being heard more, more effectively via the hearing aid. Then over here on the right, then we can see the, the level of the change um, related to the sensation level against the behavioral audiogram. So when it was well above the uh, threshold, we got um, a very big amplitude response. When it was just a little bit above the threshold or um, a low sensation level, so uh, maybe not heard at all as that low one, um, somewhere between zero and 10 was that middle one and well over 10, so 10 dB above threshold. Okay. So that's uh, at least an indication that they're accessing conversational levels within their dynamic range. Now, unlike the type of, just to emphasize a point that I should probably uh, stress, unlike the type of hearing aid evaluations that I was referring to with adults, where you might ask about things like sound quality, is it too tinny, is it too bassy, is it too, we don't get that information, okay? All we get is an indication as to whether the sound was heard or not. But it's just bridging that gap between the point where the child will transition to, um, hear, uh, to, to behavioral um, testing, where we might start to then access that more detailed information. So hopefully by now you're um, happy to uh, um, see the, the feasibility of these corticals in the sound field. Um, the fact that when you put a hearing aid in, if the child has a hearing loss, then the response goes up, showing that the signal was more audible. Um, and, of course, as I mentioned, the work in the UK with that truck, the, the work is in hand, but at least from the uh, body of literature that's emerging now, then we can see that uh, it's feasible down to that age range of, of interest. Now, if you don't, well, proving a negative is very hard. So if you don't see a response, what does that mean? You wouldn't press the emergency panic button and straight to um, cochlear implant assessment if you happen to just see one 
one um, trace that had a flat line or at least no detectable response. What we'd be keen to note is if it was consistently low for several different stimuli at several different levels and perhaps um, assessed over, set over a couple of different appointment slots as well. That's the point where you might be then using that information alongside others to decide whether or not you change the, hear, uh, the hearing aid gain um, or perhaps expedite for implant assessment, for, for example. Just on that note of, of proving a negative, here's some yet more traces from Rady. We did a lot of work on uh, a couple of days ago. Now, this is a child with auditory neuropathy, and uh, this child has, uh, we, is old enough to show, her, show us his behavioral, um, behavioral uh, um, thresholds. I think he was maybe two or three years old off, off, off memory. So we know he was hearing the sound, but this is a good demonstration that at least, and it may well be because of his auditory neuropathy, um, that we, we weren't seeing a response. And to prove this negative, to prove a flat line, and we had to measure sort of several hundred, there's probably three or four hundred um, sweeps in each of these three traces. One, the top trace was both, both hearing aids in, the middle trace was one hearing aid in, and then the other trace was the other hearing aid in. So showing a response absent and knowing what to do with that patient later is a different story to, uh, to ticking off when a response is um, present, and I think that's a worthwhile point to make. All right. So the other thing is, um, just I want to just go into a little bit more detail about uh, when, when we might do these assessments. And also, um, is it always necessary to do, do the assessment after the hearing aid has been fitted? Is there any value in doing the, a cortical assessment only unaided, somewhere in the gray zone between diagnosis via your ABR or ASSR and later on fitting? Is there a, a, an application there? So let's just think a bit about this. Now when it comes to an adult, this is a time and then performance of a hearing aid just been fitted. When it comes to an adult, we do our evaluations in such a time that we can take into account two things when we measure performance. Performance might be speech testing or questionnaires. The first thing that happens is when the hearing aid is fitted, we see an immediate jump in performance because all sounds suddenly become more audible than they used to be. But then we see, in an adult, a more gradual increase, which we often use the phrase acclimatization, a kind of a plasticity effect where they get to use the hearing aid and performance increases more gradually. So we do our evaluations in an adult some weeks or months later to capture the optimum performance level. But if we were to wait an undue period of time in an infant, then that could lead itself to problems. Of course, we might have missed an opportunity to maybe adjust the hearing aid gain in a positive way than if we would have done the assessment earlier. So there's, um, oops. So there's uh, every reason to think that perhaps um, doing the evaluation somewhere within a month or so of a fitting might be, um, or, or, and even earlier potentially, perhaps a couple of weeks later, might be a, a good sort of um, time scale to work on. And we're trying to balance those two things. So we want the child to get to their optimum performance, but um, there's changes in the corticals anyway due to maturation. So how would you tease those two things apart? Um, and uh, as I say, if we left it too long, then you know, maybe we'll have reached the point where we'd get the earliest time where they could do behavioral thresholds anyway, in which case we've kind of defeated the object. So it'd be very good to, to get in there as early as possible, perhaps two to four weeks after the fitting. Okay. Now, this is a useful um, in, a demonstration of that. There's something, uh, yeah, that's what, I'm seeing something slightly different on my screen here than what uh, you're seeing on there. I'm not sure what's going on. Let me um, just draw your attention to this paper here. This is um, a, a clinical report, again, from, uh, from Australia. It's kind of the cradle of this work. Um, I draw your attention to that paper because they've got a detailed protocol uh, clinical protocol, which you, you could then adopt that in your clinic if, you, if you're not doing this already. But what they did was, um, they, so they tested the child, and around about two-thirds of this cohort of 83 were seen within a couple of months. And it was taking, again, around about two-thirds or so, uh, just less than an hour, but a small minority uh, for one assessment was taking 90 minutes. And their protocol was um, with, the set, with the hearing aids in, start at 65. If they saw a response, turn it down. Do they still see a response even at low levels? If they didn't see a response, turn it up. 
and also if the child still cooperates and moves to unaided. And depending on what they saw, so if they didn't see a response um, at 65, but they did see one at 75, that might give you an indication that, oh, maybe we're just under amplifying a little bit. Because they can hear loud level conversation, but not normal level. So they might increase the gain. And they're going in steps of that one standard deviation, so 10 dB steps at a time. And on the other hand, if they turn the sound up to 75 and there was still no response, as I say, and that's consistently the case over the course of a number of um, uh, different stimuli, then that would be where you might choose to use this information alongside other sources of information at your disposal, any behavioral observations you might have seen and so on, to re request uh, an implant assessment, for instance. Another, um, another demonstration, a clinical demonstration, comes from the UK and it was published around about the same time. And what this uh, cohort did, or what this, sorry, what this group did was they um, took a, a cohort, uh, they, well, they, they, there was like a retrospective study. So they looked at the, um, the age of fitting and other, uh, and other kind of outcome measures for their service at some point in the past, a few years ago, before they were doing cortical evoked potentials in their hearing aid evaluations. And then what they did was, in a second cohort that came along after they introduced this uh, technique to their service, and they did this, they introduced it in two steps, which, are, which I'm just going to unpack in a moment. Then they reanalyzed the same outcome measures, age of fitting, um, um, uh, parental acceptability, and so on. But they did two things here. They did the same hearing aid evaluation as the previous uh, study that we just looked at. Okay. But they also did a pre-fitting evaluation. They used just the unaided corticals on their own as a, a, a tool to help guide and educate both the audiologists themselves, but also the parents. And this is, I think, a good um, rationale for why you might first choose to use the sound field. Now, let me just try and explain my thinking here a little bit. So if you're the parent of a child who's come in the neonatal period for an ABR or an ASSR assessment, then just think about what that is like for you, know, for you as a parent who, as far as the audiological technique is concerned, you're a lay person. An ABR and ASSR means nothing to you. Really, what you do is you sit there with your child in your arms and some wires on, and then you don't hear the sounds because they're played into the child's ear, and you might just sit there for well, we saw some of the test times earlier, half an hour or so for eight frequencies for an ABR, 20 minutes or so for an ASSR. Now, your audiologist is very likely to explain all of this to you, and that's great. But nevertheless, it's still a rather abstract thing. And if you're then going to have to accept all of the news, if there is a hearing loss, then what does that really actually mean? Your deaf child, if there is a hearing loss, probably isn't behaving any differently to a normally hearing child at that very early age. So it can be difficult for people to absorb this information. Now, if you take your child in the sound field, now your parents, from the counseling point of view, they are witnessing more directly for themselves what's going on, because they can hear the sound, and yet there's flat lines appearing on the screen. So it's a more direct kind of demonstration without that abstract component to it. And so we'll just have a little look at how that might have influenced the outcome measures on this service as well. And uh, some of those issues are related here. So we're really only halfway there when we do detection. What is going to make a difference to this child's lifestyle is the point at which there is intervention. And so if you can demonstrate a hearing loss to those people that might sit on the fence or be unconvinced or unsure, and then that leads to an earlier intervention, then you're further forward in that child's development than what you might otherwise have been. That's the, the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, so this is, um, this is the results. So this is the first cohort, which they looked at retrospectively. And what we see on here is the age of fitting. Most children, uh, most parents of uh, children with deaf children, uh, uh, most parents of the children with deafness would follow the audiologist's recommendation. But some parents might have sat on the fence and then the, the median age of fitting was a bit later. This was without corticals, co cohort A. Now cohort B, 
you can see that for both, whether it was um, parents that are following the recommendation of the audiologist or those that um, may otherwise have sat on the fence, they were more convinced by the demonstration of um, the corticals, the, the, un the unaided corticals. So the age of hearing aid fitting went down. Now, you might be casting your mind back to that slide I showed earlier where I showed that downwards trend anyway, and you might be thinking, wow, how do we know that this isn't just a, re you know, a reflection of that? But when they unpacked the data a little, a little bit more detailed there, then they found that the main reason for driving down those age of fitting on the, on the right-hand panel was due to the mild hearing losses. Those that um, either the audiologist wasn't quite sure for themselves, and they, said, they might have said, well, you know, um, let's wait until we can see some behavioral responses before we know more clearly what to do. Or indeed, if it was the parents that might have been um, less, com less convinced. Well, now there was that demonstration. And if, if, it, if it was uh, just a general reflect of the trends, then it wouldn't have come out in only the mild um, loss cases. So that's why we think that it's more attributable to the, the only change in terms of the service between these two cohorts was the introduction of the um, cortical responses. All right, so that's where we're up to. So we can use this as a tool to counsel and educate our parents, as I mentioned earlier anyway, to evaluate the success or otherwise the effectiveness of our amplification and decide or help decide in whether or not we should go for candidacy, uh, for cochlear implant candidacy. And in some cases, it might be useful in an assessment to um, uh, use with auditory neuropathy cases where ABR and ASSR are obviously far more limited. So that brings me to the next, it's just one question and then I'm gonna uh, close with a nod towards what happens tomorrow. So that's today and then what happens tomorrow and I've got about 25 or so minutes for that. So please, uh, please look at this one. All right, let's have a look. Oops, I'm sorry, it's disappeared. Yeah, that's absolutely great. Now, um, so for reasons of counseling and for reasons of having the hearing aid in the pathway, the loudspeaker, the sound field would be great. It's not your only option though, and that's the point I should make. So you can, have, uh, you can do this process with direct audio input. And that would be fine for, ver for evaluating the fitting, but you would lose to some extent that counseling benefit because then you're back to the abstract concept that I mentioned earlier where the parents, guardians of that child can't can't hear for themselves, they can't witness it for themselves. So you, you get part of the, the, the um, benefits, but, but not necessarily all of it. Okay, so thanks for um, taking part in those questions. Now let's have a think about what happens or what might happen um, on the horizon. Now on our shopping list of um, an objective tool for hearing aid evaluation, the last point on the shopping list was some way in which we might be able to tell not only can the sound be heard, audibility, but can the sounds, can different sounds be discriminated? Can they be heard as different? Now, we can divide this, uh, this question into two broad group, two broad uh, subgroups. We can think about discrimination between two different stimuli, or we could think about the discrimination between the same stimuli at two or more different volumes. So there's a discrimination of level, and discrimination of different stimuli. And on a group level, this isn't actually too difficult. Here's some grand average data. You can use the morphology to try and assess this. This is grand average data for three different speech tokens and a couple of pure tones. And you can see that there's all these different values for uh, latency and the morphology and, and amplitude changes. Okay, so. Uh, let's think about why that might be. Why might, why might morphology change uh, between different stimuli? And how can we assess that objectively? This can be assessed with a technique known as uh, the MANOVA, multivariate ANOVA. Now we don't need to get too technical, but generally, uh, or essentially the, the process would be to divide your waveform up into these little time bins and then um, hopefully without being overly, overly simplistic about it, do little F tests, just like we were talking about earlier with the uh, FMP, so little um, uh, comparisons of variance between uh, the responses in each time bin, so amplitude um, in each time bin, and the response of, um, uh, of a different stimulus. 
And if they're consistently different to one another, that gives you an indication that the morphology must have been different. And perhaps, if the morphology is different, then that sound was heard as different, which sort of stands to reason. Let's think a bit about why that might be the case. So this is just zooming in. Um, again, it's just a simplified schematic of the uh, of one temporal lobe. And maybe with one sound, the yellow one, the ga, maybe just hypothetically we um, primarily stimulate this group of neurons over here, this population of neurons, which has a certain spatial relationship to the electrodes on the surface, and it ends up giving us this type of response over here. But then later on, we come in with our other stimulus, the ma, and it has a, a, a stimulated a different group of neurons. This is just hypothetical to convey the, the concept. It's obviously a bit more complicated than this in real life. But this group of neurons over here is in a slightly different place, a slightly different orientation and position with respect to our fixed position of the electrodes on the surface. And so we end up generating a slightly different change in the bioelectrical potential, which is reflected in, in that morphology. So that absolutely stands to reason. But the thing is, it's well, uh, it's well demonstrated on a group level and much harder to show that statistically from one individual to another. This is a, a study, in, again, that came from uh, Manchester, and they looked at detection and they looked at discrimination in uh, a group of just adults now, just to, just to demonstrate the concept. And the adults did it both uh, with unplugged and then with earplugs in to simulate um, a mild hearing loss. Okay. And they had a very good increase in detectability, statistically as well as visually, um, between the unplugged and then the plugged. Uh, simulating hearing loss. So there's no concern about audibility. But when trying to look at discrimination using this man-over approach, then on an individual level, the uh, rates of detection, so they could all hear the difference behaviorally, they had normal hearing, and they could state, yes, I can hear one's a ta, one's a ga, etc. But um, the ability to show that using that morphology approach was very, very low, a, a rather a hit and miss approach, in other words. So it hasn't, um, it's not something that we might recommend. We can use this, um, use this to tell us about whether a sound is heard or not, but this approach alone, this cortical approach alone, can't, can't be used easily right now to tell us about whether two sounds were heard as different to one another. Okay? So that's two different stimuli. Remember, that also, you might want to know about discrimination between two different levels. So I'll just draw your attention to this study over here. This is a study from the US, um, Curtis Billings and others. And they were looking at the effect of volume. And I'll just try and, it's, it's, a, it's a rather complicated slide, so I'll just try and take two minutes to explain it. So they looked at audibility. This is um, a group of normally hearing um, listeners. And they simulated a hearing loss with a, a masking noise, which is this hatched area. And they had cortical stimuli Okay, at um, different volumes and so different levels of audibility, either below the masker so that the sound couldn't be heard, or you can see these others that are above the masker so that the sound could be heard. Okay, so when they looked at audibility, what they did was they had a look at this um, uh, the, the, uh, this t this test condition here where the sound couldn't be heard; it was well below the masker, and then these two were just combined into one group. And so the, the cortical, the volume of the cortical, uh, the, the, the test stimulus was above the level of the mask, so it could be heard. So they looked at audibility between this one and this one. We'll have a look at that, and but our prediction would be, our hypothesis would be that the cortical should appear in that second condition, these two combined where the sound was low audibility. And then they also had a look at discrimination of different volumes. So that draws me to these two columns on the right. Now, this is the, uh, the cortical stimulus, uh, the, the, um, the speech token, above the level of the masker. And also, you can see it's just at the level, the, the, the green bar is just at the same level as the masker. Now, that green bar represents um, the, the, uh, the background noise that you get with a hearing aid, circuit noise. Okay? And then, so they kept the circuit noise at the level of the masker so that it should have been inaudible. Then we, then we go over, so the signal was audible above the, above the masker, but the circuit noise wasn't. Then we go to this final condition over here, where the overall stimulus was increased in volume, 
but the circuit noise was also increased in volume too. So the signal to noise ratio between this condition and this condition, okay, the fourth and the fifth on there, the signal to noise ratio was the same, but the sound had overall increased in volume. So we're now using this to tell us about discrimination of different, two different volumes. And the hypothesis here, well, we'd like to know if it could or not. So I'll just leave the hypothesis closed for, set for now. But the first one was sound was inaudible, sound was just audible. This is the grand average data for when the sound was inaudible, and this is the cortical appearing when the sound became audible. Now, this is what we call global field power. So it's uh, the uh, average response from lots of different electrodes all around the scalp. So it doesn't look quite the same as those traces we were looking at earlier. So we can use the response. Yes, that reaffirms what I've already tried to say. We can use the response to tell us about an increase in audibility, and that's good. It's sensitive to that. But would it be sensitive to a change in volume? Now, these corticals, I haven't unpacked this concept in much detail yet, but the amplitude that we get depends not so much on the absolute level of the stimulus, but the signal-to-noise ratio. And of course, in those two different conditions, because of the circuit noise, the signal-to-noise ratio wasn't changing. So the person can hear the sound as louder, because the absolute level goes up, but the cortical response doesn't reflect that. It's not sensitive to a change in absolute level, uh, certainly through a hearing aid anyway, and that's what we're really interested in. Okay, so at, at this point, we're very happy that our corticals can tell us about audibility, and it's an onset response, but not about discriminating between different stimuli, because that's unreliable, and not about discriminating between different volumes, because that's unreliable too. And that's an onset response. So let's just have a look at what other tools that are at our disposal that might be able to tell us a bit about this. And I've just got um, about 10 or so minutes left, so I'm just going to increase the pace a little bit so I don't keep us all from our coffees. So there are a number of tools that we could use to do this. One is known as the mismatch negativity, and this is my personal favorite. We also have something called the acoustic change complex, and both of these are, have good application or potential application in infants. This one up here, perhaps less so. This is an event-related potential known as the P300. Um, and your Eclipse can do it. And if you want to learn more about it, then please look at my webinar on that. But it, it's not something I'm going to talk about anymore today. But let's look at this, something called the acoustic change complex. So this, this N1P2, this is just the adult morphology here, just for the time being. Of course, that's what we've been talking about uh, now to tell us about whether the sound can be audible. And we can think of it as the, the brain's signal to say that something's changed in the auditory environment. That's what they mean by acoustic change complex. So when a sound appears, a beep, then the thing that's changed is we've gone from silence to sound. And we see, we can call that as an onset response. And this is the sound here. Maybe it's a 50 millisecond beep for example, or a, tone, a, tone, uh, a speech token. If we make that sound a little bit longer, being an onset response, everything downstream of the signal is not going to contribute, of the response, sorry, it's not going to contribute anymore. The signal's an onset response. It's already happened. So just making the sound a little bit longer doesn't really change the, uh, the, um, the response too much. It's really the first 30 or so milliseconds that drives the onset response. But now if we make the sound much longer, then we see a second response, which is sometimes known as the offset response. And here, the acoustic change, the, the change in the auditory environment is sound beep to silence. And that transition from sound to silence triggers a secondary response. So when we talk about the acoustic change complex, really it's any of these, but the one that we're actually referring to is the one that might happen downstream. So how can this be used? Um, so acoustic change complex could be silence to sound, could be sound to silence, but how can this be used to, to tell us about discrimination between two different sounds? Well, what we could do is we could just have one sound concatenated to another sound, and as you transition between the two, if you hear that transition, you've discriminated that difference, then you'll see an acoustic change complex. And uh, this has been uh, kind of well looked at, so let's have a little look at that. So here's um, a, a da stimulus, for example, a speech token, a da, or a bar. On their own, they would just trigger the first one, the onset response. But if you concatenated the two together, 
and the person hears when the sound goes from da to ba, then you'll see um, a, a, a response in the middle there. That's what we're in. And if, if, you, so if that appears, the sound must have been discriminated. And it's that second one. So all we need to do is we need to just work out the time at which we transitioned between the two, and then the response should be around about 100 or so milliseconds for an adult, or perhaps a little bit further downstream than that for a child, um, and that will give us an indication of discrimination. Okay, so this has been, um, there's some excitement around this, but there's certainly an emerging um, literature, and uh, here's one of the, um, another study, uh, I think it's also from the US that um, has uh, told us a bit about this. This is a preliminary study, and they looked at some, a small cohort of adults, as well as in a moment I'll show you some pediatric um, data too. So they had a good long duration stimulus, and the starting point was the DA, and it was several hundred milliseconds. Okay? And then they had three different stimulus conditions where we transitioned to a second speech token. It was either DA to DA, DA to BA, or DA to DA with a big capital D. <laughs> okay, so um, this is the DA on its own, so there's the onset response, and that's consistent each time because that was the first stimulus. But then this shows the acoustic change complex when we transition to the DA, the BA, and then the other DA. And it was consistently there, at least in this small cohort for adults. Okay, so it's possible to elicit um, a response like this, and that tells us objectively about spe speech discrimination. And it's really just an evolution of the um, audibility um, that I was talking about earlier. So now, this was um, uh, also looked at in um, a, a cohort of infants, all right? And uh, this was all done in the sound field at conversational levels in the type of age category that we might be interested in. So this is the responses that we were just um, looking at, the same three conditions, but this is the responses from, uh, from, those, from those infants. Just gonna, um, uh, again, I'm seeing something slightly different on the screen, <laughs> on the screen here, I'm not too sure why. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, so let's see. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the DA on its own, okay? When we transition between the da and the ba in these infants, you could clearly see that acoustic change complex. So that's a good demonstration, at least for that one type of stimulus transition, that it could be used in the age group of interest too. You might note this very curious finding where in this small group, this uh, young age group, the morphology of these traces look just like it did for the adults. When I was saying earlier that there's this maturational effect, and that might be related to the very, very long um, interstimulus interval, the very low rate of stimulus presentation where there were several seconds between each stimulus, as opposed to maybe a normal rate of about one hertz um, for the audibility task. So they could show it for the da bar. Interestingly, it wasn't clearly there for these other two transitions, so it's unclear about exactly why that is, and it's um, certainly an emerging area of research, but, but that's, that was kind of where that study left, left the, the story for us. I'm not sure what that one on the left is. I want to talk to you about this other um, procedure, though, known as the mismatch negativity. And because this is the one which I have, um, uh, I, I think that there's a, this is likely to be a very good avenue of research. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so this mismatch negativity. Let me talk to you a bit about what this is. And again, I've done a webinar, so uh, if you would like to hear about this in more detail, then just tune into the webinar, but this is an abbreviated version of that. So the mismatch negativity um, is characterized in some ways by the uh, stimulus paradigm, and it uses what's known as an oddball stimulus paradigm. So we might have beep, 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 somewhere embedded within that stimulus train in a very low probability, there'll be a sound that deviates from the majority of them. That's known as the oddball or the deviant. And then the one that occurs frequently is known as the frequent stimulus, okay? Or sometimes known as the standard. Now, if, those, if that deviant stimulus is heard as a deviant, then its response will differ in some way than the, the, to the standard. And the way in which that happens is hopefully conveyed on this slide here. So this trace, we see the normal N1P2 complex, 
to a 1,000 hertz beep. This is just a single adult now. It's me, actually. Um, so these are my MMNs. So we see uh, N1, P2. Every time a deviant comes along, and this is a low probability, just 0.2, and it's a, a, just a 32 hertz higher. So I'll just hear this as a slightly higher pitch. And when I hear that slightly higher pitch stimulus, two things happen. I get this dip here, and I get a slightly bigger amplitude of the N1 response too. And it's this dip here that's known as the mismatch negativity. But if I didn't hear that pitch difference, if I just heard it as another 1,000 hertz sweep, then I wouldn't have seen that dip. It would have just overlaid just like the other trace. So that dip there, that MMN, tells me that, I mean, uh, I was the listener in this example, but it tells us as the, as the audiologist that the, the signal was heard as different. So we see a change or a different amplitude in the ALR, and we also see the MMN there. Okay. And there's my two deviants. Now, I'll just quickly talk to you about uh, the general pattern that this MMM follows, and then we'll have a look at how this has been used in pediatrics, and then that will just, uh, that will just uh, draw things to a close. So this is that trace I just showed you a moment ago. So the, de the standard was 1,000 hertz, and the deviant was slightly higher in frequency. It was 1,032 hertz, and there's where I saw my MMN. Okay? Now, in this middle group of traces, I made the difference in frequency bigger. So there was a larger pitch difference. It's easier discrimination task, in other words, and that makes the MMN come earlier. So if I have a look at the MMN in this middle group, here I see it, and it's earlier in latency than that first one. And also, we still see the same sort of difference in the um, M1 trace. Now if we come down to this lower group, now I've made the difference even bigger. Now the deviant is 3,000 hertz, a much bigger pitch difference to the standard, so it's an even easier discrimination task, and so the latency of the MMN becomes even earlier. Now it's so early that it's actually fused with the N1, so they come, they come together as a kind of uh, a double peaked um, effect there. So you can see that latency change. There's the latency of the first one. When the, when the um, discrimination task was a bit easier, the latency became earlier. And when it was a bit earlier still, a bit easier still, the latency became even earlier. Now if we go in the other direction, as the ALR stayed at the same latency the whole way through. If we go in the other direction, we'll make the discrimination task harder this time. So there's the starting point again, 1,000 hertz versus 1,032. If I make the difference between them smaller, now they sound more similar in pitch, and then we still get an MMN, but it's less clear now, the amplitude's gone down a bit, but also the latency's longer, the discrimination task is harder. And if I make the, the, the sound so different that they, in this short duration, small little tone burst, they are, you can't hear the difference between them, then the, the MMN disappears altogether. And this is just on one individual, an objective way, in this case bracketing, frequency discrimination. But there's nothing to stop us from using speech tokens as the standard in the deviant, and then we could use that as a way to, to assess um, speech discrimination. And that has been looked at, um, and this is a very much of a, you know, a contemporary paper. This is um, from Colorado, and you'll recognize this author because it's the same on the authorship as Yvonne's um, ASSR study that she was descri describing earlier, Christian Uller. And what they did was they took a group of patients, normal hearing again, in this case, 48. What was interesting in this case was that they were all asleep in this test, but they were in the age group of interest. And they used as a standard an R token, and then they used as a deviant an E token, speech token. And what they found was, again, so now we're back to the morphology of an infant, um, and what they found was... Uh, a, a substantial mismatch response. I've called it mismatch negativity, but they use the term mismatch response because it's going in the positive direction, which is probably a reflection of the infant morphology. Um, but they saw, uh, at least on a grand average, um, that, that deviant response triggered that mismatch, it, even when the child was asleep, which is very encouraging, I think. So there's certainly um, a, lot of way, a long way to go before this test might reach clinical maturity, and there's no guarantee that it ever will, but that's at least some flavor for what might be on, on the horizon. And um, I, for one, hope to pursue this as a, as a, as a line of research, and um, I'm sure that others are too, as you, as you can see. So we better draw things to a close on that note. 
Um, thanks very much for your attention. These are the take-home messages. So you could, tomorrow, if you wanted to, go back with your Eclipse and a loudspeaker and enact those clinical protocols that are in the published literature to use them for um, your auditory late response for your for hearing aid evaluation. And add to that, if you can, um, a V-hit, and then you've made a huge difference in that child's development. Um, maybe, in the fullness of time, we will have... Uh, a clinical assessment that can also tell us objectively about discrimination too. Thank you very much. Let's get a coffee.